Well, praise God. I'm Hal Adams. I'm lead pastor of Radford Worship Center. We want to welcome those who are uh, our guests today. We want to welcome those viewing online. And if you're viewing online, just go ahead and give us a shout. Say hello so we'll know that you are uh, watching. That's a blessing to us. If you have a prayer request, just go to the comment section and just say special request. And we will include you with our, our prayer list over the course of the week. <clears throat> today, we are in the third installment of a series that I'm calling the counselor. Well, he said Jesus asked 135 questions during his ministry on earth. He used questions uh, to lead people to examine themselves and discover truth for themselves. That's what a good counselor does. A good counselor is not going to give you directives. A, a, a good counselor is going to uh, lead you to a place that you can discover your own truth for yourself. In week one, he asked his disciples, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were led to look within and really answer the question, what do we really believe about Jesus? In week two, uh, he asked the blind men, uh, do you believe that I can? And th this question le led these men to basically ask the same question, what do we believe about Jesus? Well, they believed that Jesus was the son of David, that he was the Messiah, the son of God. And when Jesus asked them, asked them do you believe that I can? They said, yes, Lord, Amen. we do. And their eyes were opened. Now, this morning, we're going to look at another question. Jesus asks a crippled man, do you want to be made well? So we're going to be going in a moment to the Gospel of John, but I just think this is a little nuance I want to give you before we get to the Scripture. You know, uh, this particular day in the ministry of Jesus was really sort of a, a, a ministry-changing day. You know, prior to this point, you know, Jesus was operating in signs and wonders. He was proclaiming the truth. He was teaching with great authority. The crowds would gather and follow him. Uh, and, and, but they still sort of sat back and they had a reservation about who he was. They really weren't sure as to who this man was. Was he a prophet? Was he a teacher? Was he a miracle worker? Okay. So on this day, Jesus performs a miracle on the Sabbath. And now their reservation turns to outright rejection. So this was a turning point in his ministry. Jesus went up to a man who had a long-term problem. He had a problem for 38 years, and he asked him, do you want to be made well? Now, there may be somebody here this morning that you can identify with this man. You have a long-term problem. You're struggling with something maybe for years. And problems can come in various forms. It could be a long-term problem with addiction. You know, you may have tried to beat it, but for some reason, you know, as hard as, as you try, you keep reverting back to it. It could be a sexual addiction, a pornography addiction. Some, for some, it might be pills. It might be alcohol abuse. It may be weed. It may be food. It may be a struggle with a long-term problem such as anger, control, indifference, insecurity, a critical tongue, laziness, health issues. It could be a long-term problem such as overspending, living above your, mean, your means, and now you're being crushed by debt. It could be the long-term problem is seeing yourself as a victim. It could be a long-term marriage problem. You, you've worked on these issues, but they keep coming back, and you just can't seem to whip them. It disrupts the family and unity in the home. See, this morning we're going to look at a man that has a long-term problem, 38 years. So let's go to John 5, look at verses 1 through 9. Okay, sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now, there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades, here, a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and they waited for the moving of the waters. 
Verse 4, from time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. Now, uh, before we start, you know, getting into the, the main uh, the main part of this message this morning, I want you to know that the word Bethesda literally means place of mercy. So this man was positionally in a good place. He was a man in need of mercy, and he, he positioned himself to be at the place of mercy. Here was a man that had a problem 38 years, a health condition, and therefore he needed God's intervention. Either way, it, it, whether he was uh, born with this condition and he was 38 years old, when we look at the little video that, that we shot, it looked like a 38-year-old man, okay? And it could have been uh, some type of a birth condition that caused him to be lame or he, he could have been 50 years old for all we know. The Bible doesn't say. Maybe he had some type of an accident. Now, maybe he got some type of a debilitating disease, but at the end of the day, the problem was long-term, 38 years. There he lay on a map. Now, when we look at this story, I, I think we see something that is very important. This man, because of his condition, he put his hope he placed his faith in a fable. See, you might say, well, what do you mean a fable? That man believed that an angel was going to drop down from heaven, stir up some water, and if he got in it first, he was going to be made well. It was a fable. Matter of fact, you might say, well, pastor, it's in the scripture. You shouldn't say that. Yes, I should, yes, I should because in the original manuscripts, verse 4 was not there in John's manuscript wasn't there. It was later added as a footnote to, to make the readers aware of what their, their hope was placed in. Okay? So, so if it's included in your translation, as a matter of fact, a lot of translations omit verse 4. Okay? They don't, they don't even include it. Yours may. Nothing wrong with that. Why? Because it sort of enlightens us as to their cultural thinking that an angel would come and stir the water. But more important, importantly than that is this point that, that I want to communicate to you this morning. What it shows us is that their hope was misplaced. Their hope, their faith, their trust was misplaced. They were believing in snake oil. Looking for the magical quick fix, right? That's sort of what people do. Let's take the pill, buy the product, scratch the ticket, muster the willpower. Let's buy a self-help book. You know, we do a good job helping ourselves, right? Everything will be better. This book will just change your life. Long-term problems can cause the best of people to look for bubbling water instead of living water. See, the scriptures tell us something here. Jesus saw him and learned of his condition. He didn't have a word of knowledge. I believe what happened was this. Maybe one of his disciples or one of the people that, were tra that was traveling with Jesus knew this man and knew his story. And, you know, I'm assuming they just went up to Jesus and said, Hey, you know, I know that guy over there. And, uh, you know, he's had this condition for 38 years and probably shared with Jesus his story. It said Jesus learned of his condition. So Jesus is now aware of the man's story. So the God of mercy is at, a, at the place of mercy. 
and he approaches a man in need of mercy and he asks him a question. Do you want to be made well? Now, I don't know about you, but I thought this so many times. Why in the world did Jesus ask that question? I mean, you've heard of Captain Obvious, right? I mean, the guy is there putting his hope in bubbling water, hoping to get in, hoping to get a miracle, and Jesus asks him a question, do you want to be made well? The one thing that Jesus does that we don't do, he looks through the obvious to ask the unobvious. See, this question that Jesus was asking this man that day is basically this. Do you really want to be well? It's very easy to say, I want to be free of this. I want to get rid of this. I'm in bondage. But the question we have to ask is do we really want to? See, not everyone who says, I want to be well, wants to be well. Not everyone who says, I want to be free, wants to be free. Why? Because they love what they're doing. No matter how destructive it is, it feeds their flesh. It feeds their life. It forms their life. Long-term problems, whatever they are, over a period of time will shape us and they will form our lives. We need to understand that. This morning, we're going to see the results of what long-term problems do if we don't confront them, okay? Look, look, uh, I'm I'm preaching this with a heart of love. I'm teaching this because, you know what, honestly, I'm just tired of seeing people in bondage. But you've got to answer the same question that Jesus asked this man. Do you want to be well? Okay, when a long-term problem persists, number one, it's in your outline. If you want to fill it out, they discourage us. Understand, the mental shift begins. You know, we think, oh, I've been dealing with this thing for a year, and, and nothing changes. I've worked on it. I can't shake it. I stop for a while. I end up going back to it. And over a period of time, we sort of get disgusted with ourselves, and we become discouraged. And we now believe we can't beat this, we can't change, that we don't have the willpower, and that nothing we try works. Now, at the end of the day, that's all true. Because getting fixed isn't self-help. And that's what so many humans, even believers, try to do. They try to fix themselves. They put their hope in snake oil. They put their hope in bubbling water. The song, or the, uh, Solomon said this in Proverbs 13, 12. He said, hope deferred makes the heart sick. When we put our hope in something other than God, when we put our hope in something other than Christ, when we put our hope in something other than the Holy Spirit, let me tell you what, we are literally deferring our hope because we can't help ourselves. And that's why we become so easily discouraged. Just go to a local Barnes & Noble. Just go to the one in Christiansburg. Walk up and down the aisles. You'll find out that 70% of the books in Barnes & Noble are self-help books. Why? Because people don't like themselves. They don't. I mean, uh, how you can, you you know, fix your body by dieting, fitness, a healthy lifestyle, how to prevent aging. I don't know how they can do that. Somebody gets the formula on that, let me know. Okay. (laughs) You know, there's books on sexual addictions. There's books on chemical addictions, anger management, how to be more positive, how to win friends and influence people, how to be debt-free, how to have a happy marriage, how to discover who you are, all self-help. And these books are selling like crazy. Why? Because people just don't like each other and they don't like what they're bound in. They don't like They just don't like themselves. You understand? They don't. So they put their hope in snake oil, self-help. 
I can do this myself. Well, good luck with that. I love you. Good luck with that. It's a band-aid. We have a gushing wound inside. And we're trying to mask it. This man was at a place of discouragement. How many times had he put his hope in that that water would be stirred by an angel and he would get a miracle? How many times had he been to the pool? How many days did he waste, months, years, trying to get in? He was at a place of discouragement. The second thing that long-term problems do is this. They cause us to look for excuses. Jesus asked him, do you want to be well? And his reply was, I have no one to help me. Matter of fact, you know, if if that water is stirred, somebody beats me to it. I can't get in. Why do we make excuses? Excuses defer personal accountability. Her fault, his fault, my wife's fault, my husband's fault, my kid's fault, the boss's fault. You know, I can't help this. It's in my DNA. I just can't help this. How about this one? I'm not perfect. Everybody has something. That's true, but it's an excuse. It's the excuse of someone who does not want to be well and confront what's in them. Excuses do not excuse us. And it's easy to start making them, isn't it? You know, the psalmist had a problem with his mouth. Some people have problems with their mouth, don't they? They're callous, critical, snide. The psalmist evidently had a problem. And so he goes to God. He finally goes to God. And this is what he says. Let's go to the scripture, Psalms 141. Take control of what I say. He's saying, God, I admit I have a problem. And how to win friends and influence people did not help me. I still have it. Nothing wrong with the book. I have a copy on my shelf. Didn't work for me either. He said, take control of what I say. Oh, Lord. Notice he's not going to bubbling water. He's going to living water. He's going to the only one that can help him. He said, and guard my lips. God, you guard my lips. You put a guard over my lips. When when, when I'm getting ready to speak something evil, I want the Spirit of God to quench my heart. I want him to grip my heart, put a guard over my lips so I will not let these things come out. Incline not my heart to evil words. He's saying, change my heart. Create in me a new heart and renew in me that loyal spirit, okay? And to make what? Not to make any excuses for sins. See, he acknowledged he owned his problem. He called it sin. He took it to God and asked for his help. Psalms 121, 1 through 3, another powerful scripture. I like this translation. I look up to the mountains. Does my help come from there? Let me just revise that. I look to the self-help. Does my help come from there? No. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let you stumble. And he's the one who watches over you and does not slumber. See, our misplaced hope is going to lead to our discouragement. Discouragement is going to lead to excuses. The lame man was excusing himself to Jesus. I have no one to help me. 
Isn't it fascinating to you? He didn't know who Jesus was, right? I mean, he's a parent. He didn't say son of God. He didn't say son of David. He didn't say master. He didn't say rabbi. He didn't say Jack, did he? Jesus approached him and said, do you want to be well? Now, you would have thought that this guy would have said, sir, I don't know who you are. But I see you, and I see 12, 13, maybe 14, 15, 16 others. Would y'all help me get to the pool? He didn't even ask for that. Why? Because this brings me to my third point. Then we compensate. We get discouraged. We make excuses. Now we're compensating. Managing our lives around it. This lame man, now think about it, this lame man was somehow getting around. He got to Bethesda, did he not? He was somehow getting around. He was somehow making a living, probably begging for alms. That's what they did in that culture. He, he, was, he was existing and compensating for his life by depending on other people. And that became what he was familiar with. That became his lifestyle. He learned to exist in it, manage his life around it. And there are people that manage their lives around their addiction. Anger, insecurity. They, 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 they manage their lives in their bad relationships at home. Others don't see it. Why? Because, you know, when they come to church on Sunday, you know, they got the look. How you doing? Blessed, hallelujah. Woo. Woo. Oh, yeah, I got a witness on that. You feel that spirit is in here today, man. And then they go home, they're blowing up on somebody. Or they're going home and they're getting wasted out of their mind. You understand? Compensating. Why do we compensate? Because that's what we're familiar with. And familiarity can be the greatest obstacle of your faith. Let me just say this. What we tolerate, we will not change. What we tolerate, we will not change. Why? Because we've accepted it. We've compensated for it. It's now formed in our heart. Therefore, that brings me to point four. It now becomes our identity. It becomes who we are. Do you see why Jesus asked the unobvious question? Sir, do you want? Do you want to be made well? You cannot help any person, no matter how much you want to, unless they want to be helped. How many of you in your life have seen someone you love or a friend that you knew they were on a path of destruction and you did your best to help them. But they would, they, they would have no part of it. How many? Raise your hand. Let me see. I'm going to see. And the rest of you need to start trying to help people. <laughs> that should have been every hand in here for crying out loud. You can't help somebody who doesn't want to help. I don't care if they're your kid. I don't care if they're your brother. I don't care who they are, your husband, your wife. I don't care what you love them. They have to want it. See, this man was led by Jesus in one question to look on the inside, to sift through his misplaced hope, to sift through his discouragement, excuses, compensation and his false identity see he saw himself I am a lame man dependent on someone else some people see themselves as a sexual addict that's what I am and I cannot change it I am an, a, a chemical addict I cannot change it I, I am angry that's who I am. 
and I cannot change it. And they're 100% correct. They can't change anything. God can change their heart if they want help. And until they come to that point that they hate what they're in, I believe when Jesus asked this question, that's when he began to operate in the fullness of prophetic office and peer into his heart. Does this man want to be well? I believe that man on the inside was thinking this in his heart and in his mind. I'm sick of depending on other people. I'm sick of lying on a mat. I'm sick of putting my hope in something that's false. I'm sick of this identity of mine. I want to change. And Jesus looked at him and said, pick up your mat. That's when power is released. I've seen people come to the altar. I want to pray. I want to be free of this. They didn't want to let go of it. Why? They liked it. They didn't want to let go of it. Because what they wanted to be free of, they could be free of. But they were tied to it. That was their identity. That's who they were. And they just don't want to let go. Jesus approaches him in verse 14. I don't want to conclude this without making note of this. Jesus looks him up. The man walked off. So Jesus looks him up there in the temple that day, and he says something to him. He said, you know, now that you're well, he said, I want you to stop sinning. I want you to quit putting your hope in bubbling water. Church, don't put your hope in self-help. Say this with me. I I cannot cannot help help myself. myself. My help help comes comes from Jesus. Jesus. That's where it comes from. You can't help yourself. The book can't help you. It might give you a strategy, but the book can't help you. If the book could help you, we'd all all look like bodybuilders. We'd all look like uh, Laura Blackburn. (laughs) Ripped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't look up, right? We just we just read a book and whoo, there it is, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you 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 are you you're, you're tracking with me, man. We can't help ourselves. We need help. He he said, well, stop sinning. Quit putting your hope in something else other than me. Quit making your excuses. Take accountability. Quit compensating. Okay. Quit being familiar with these things. They're destructive to your life. And see yourself as a child of God. See yourself as mine. See yourself as, a, as mine. Remember who you are. Remember who you are, church. See, the God of mercy that day was in a place of mercy to free a man in need of mercy. The God of mercy is here today. If, if you need that mercy today, you're, you're positionally in a good place because he'll extend it to you. See, it comes down to this. Just that one encounter with Christ changed him. So let me give you four action steps real quick. I've got two minutes and 12 seconds. I've got a motor. Number one, okay. If you want to be made well from, fill in the blank. What is it that you want to be free from? I don't care what it is. You put it down. What is it you want to be free from? Number one, you've got to identify the problem. Call it what it is. If it's sin, call it sin. Admit it. Take ownership of it. Confess it to God and repent of that sin. That's where it all begins. It starts with repentance. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. Number two, ask the Holy Spirit for his help. Jesus said, I'm going to give you another helper. But, but yet yeah, yeah, we go to Barnes and Noble. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. We say we serve the eternal God. Jesus, who is there in creation, has been with the Father for all eternity, who declared this world into substance out of Nothing who holds the world together through the power of his word, who went to the cross, 
incurred God's wrath, died for our behalf. He raised his own life up and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he gave us the authority of his name. And we go to Barnes and Noble? What are we, what are we nuts? We're still trying to help ourselves. Let me get, dispel one lie. I'm going to spell a lie. Anybody ever told you, that, well, the good book says the Lord helps those who help themselves. It's nowhere in there. He said, ask me and I will help you. Amen. For crying out loud, man, let's, let, let's, get, let's get with this program, okay? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the temptations or the struggles in your life are no different. Understand this, whatever you're going through, there's a million other people in the world going through the same Yay. thing. They're not, they're, 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 they're no, no, you know, you're not by yourself. But it says God's faithful. And he will not allow the struggle to be more than you can stand. And when you struggle, he will show you a way out that you can endure. Second Corinthians 12, 9, he said to Paul, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Yeah. Ask for his help. Quit trying to do it on your own. Depend on him every day. Yeah. Number three, get godly accountability. Confine your struggle. Confide your struggle with a believer who's trusted. Find somebody you trust. You can say, look, man, I'm struggling with this. I need help in this. I need prayer in this. James said it this way. Confess your sins to each other. Pray for each other so that you can be healed. Yeah. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power, produces wonderful results. Let me tell you, when you have accountability, they will eliminate your excuses. Okay, number four and last. Know your real identity. Know who you represent. Every day, you know, when you go to school, when you go to work, when you go to Walmart, when, you, when, when you're out, anywhere you go, you represent Christ. You've been, you need to know who you are and who you represent. What you speak, people hear. What you do, people see. You're a child, a priest, a bride. You're his body. You're the temple. You're a servant. You're a friend. You're an alien. And you're an ambassador. That's what you are. Know who you are, who you represent. You were created by God for his purpose and glory to do his works that the Father can be glorified through the Son. That's why we're here, church. To know Him, to make Him known on this earth. That's why we're here. It's about asking for His help. But it all begins with this. Do you want it? Do you want it? I'm not talking about some half-hearted, I'd like to, it don't work. you got to hate it. you got to hate it. See, we, we eliminate that. God's a God of love, but he's a God who hates sin. He hates it. And when we let it get our heart, when we let it form us, he hates it. We have to hate it. And when you hate it, when you confess it, that's when you can have freedom. See, the first step to change is wanting change. That's the tweet of the day. The first step to change is wanting to change. If you don't want to change, you're never going to change. That's where it begins. With every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? You may not know him the first step is to know him. It's the first step. God loves you. He wants you to live a life of joy, contentment. And today, if you don't know him, Nobody's looking around. This is a safe place. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. But just lift your hand right now. Just lift it. If that's you, you don't know him. You don't have an assurance in your heart that he's your Lord and Savior. I'm not talking about church being raised in the church. None of that stuff. You don't know him. And you know that you don't. 
Is there one in here this morning? Second thing, nobody's looking around with this very private. But there's an area of your life that is, we've been here this morning that the Holy Spirit's revealed to you that you need to obtain freedom in. you need change. I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand up. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else. I'm just going to say thank you, thank you. Now I'd like to ask you all to stand. I'm going to ask my prayer people to come forward this morning.